All right, you want to get started? Shannon, you want to get started? Yep, that sounds great. All right, here we go. And I'll be going off. I'll be monitoring chat. So if you need anything, feel free to reach out to me personally, or if you can put it in the public screen if you want. But well, I'll be monitoring chat if you need anything. So let's get going. Um, this uh, presentation is near and dear to my heart because both in my own startup career, um, almost all of the startups I've launched have been in the disruptive category as opposed to the incremental category. And I know that because I used to go around and explain to people what I was doing and I got absolute blank stares. So generally, you know, you're early in a, in the, in a disruptive opportunity when you explain what you do and people just politely go, oh, okay, that's interesting because they have no clue what you're talking about. So that's been uh, the first 20 years of my business career. I lived with a lot of blank stares, both uh, with the PC revolution and then the uh, internet revolution and then the web services revolution, walking around telling people well, this is a big thing and nobody listens. So, um, and then with both Shannon and I working on startups, I would say 10%, maybe a little more, of the startups in which we invested were actually disruptive. The majority of startups uh, are really in the incremental category. And although this presentation is focused on disruptive innovation, I don't want to make it sound like incremental innovation isn't important or rewarding or necessary, it is. But we thought we'd focus on disruptive innovation because it is so very different. So that's the key takeaway for the whole sh for the whole show here is if I have one key thing, it's the processes that people use for managing uh, incremental innovation are not the same as the processes needed for managing disruptive innovation and mixing them up will lead to uh, inefficiencies. So with that, let me launch into this first slide, the flash starts levels of technology adoption. In our current consulting practice, we run into a lot of organizations that are at various levels of technology adoption across multiple types of disruptive uh, technologies. So this spider graph on the right-hand side here is an attempt for us to figure out where our clients live uh, across a broad spectrum of technologies, emerging technologies that are relative to them. So if you look in the very center here, um, the the bullseye, that's zero. And the uh, lines running out from that, each one represents a specific new emerging technology or, or concept. And then we plot our clients' uh, uh, existence based on where they are. So if they don't know anything about a particular emerging technology, they, they get a zero for just being unengaged. And that be, that could be because they don't know about it or possibly because they haven't, uh, they haven't heard about it yet. Tracking is when the technology bubbles up to potentially relevant and they start paying attention to it. Uh, level two, the, the third, the second outer ring is when they start taking uh, educational resources and allowing them to be applied to that technology, maybe seminars or training sessions, but just, you know, learn more about it. And then three is experimental, and they start doing very low risk experimental projects so they can learn more. Uh, four is tactical, when they do a full-blown deployment of something in a modest way. Um, and then five is strategic, where the emerging technology actually becomes part of their competitive advantage. Now, uh, technologies will drop off uh, all the time or go backwards. They may go from educational to experimental and then back to educational because the pilots failed where they may never reach the level of strategic. So it all depends on uh, who you are and uh, 
what you, what's important to your business. So this is the key slide for this whole presentation. Uh, incremental versus disruptive. Most of what you learn in entrepreneurial school, if you will, or most what most consultants give you uh, is incremental innovation. And the, the classic phrase is see a problem, solve a problem, which is why venture investors and angel investors always look for deep domain expertise. For people, uh, entrepreneurs that have been in an industry, see a problem in that industry and then attempt to solve it. Or in large corporations, individuals or groups in that corporation that have a problem and they want to solve it in an incremental fashion. It, it benefits tremendously from deep domain expertise so you can see and understand the problem. You're looking at things like 20% improvements as being uh, big wins. Uh, you deploy something like a business model canvas. You do a ton of meaningful research around product product market fit and you solicit aggressively customer feedback uh, and you you know you use Gmail for a lot of those processes the disruptive entirely different it's often a new technology that presents new opportunities you don't really want deep domain expertise because almost by definition there isn't any uh, you're looking for broad domain expertise so you can connect connect dots from different things. And you're not looking for a 20% improvement, you're looking for a 10 to 20X improvement in, in productivity, and that's why these are disruptive. Uh, rather than the business model canvas, you do feasibility experiments or the incredibly well thought through acronym TSATW, which for those of you who don't know, for disruptive innovations, you generally throw shit at the wall and see what happens. Uh, product market fit makes no sense because the product and the market don't fit anything at this point. Instead of getting customer feedback, you find yourself spending a lot of time on customer education. And Google search is your preferred tool rather than uh, Google uh, Gmail. So those are the key differences. Uh, and this is what it looks like if you look up in the air. The disruptor said, no, I'm going to go this way. Take a whole different approach to flying around. So here are best practices. This is where you can start taking notes if you want. Um, this is what we recommend organizations do on a very tactical level to navigate disruptive opportunities. And this applies both to companies that are trying to be the disruptors as well as companies that are trying to understand and forestall uh, or jump ahead of those being disrupted. Uh, and, and, you know, the, both the techniques apply to either side of the equation. So troll, that's uh, just that continuous consumption of information. Uh, new emerging technologies and opportunities can come literally from anywhere. So you really need not deep domain expertise, but broad expertise. Uh, I years ago I used to read every ma every technical magazine that was ever public ever published. Right now I spend a lot of time on things like Reddit and Google Search to try to stay on top of uh, new, new technologies. Uh, you need to flag the ones that that look interesting. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. You need to grok or understand each new technology because otherwise uh, they just appear as magic and, and you can imagine then imagine a new technology doing things for which it's not really well suited. Set inflection points um, to, in order to figure out what to do next. Monitor the technology, review it periodically, experiment to either prove or disprove your hypotheses, uh, work in combinations because a lot of times disruption actually uh, is the result of combining uh, A and B in ways that nobody had thought of before. Prototype, uh, again, this is in contrast to doing uh, market research on product market fit because you won't find any. Um, and then at some point, the disruptive innovation uh, ceases to be a disruptor because everybody understands it. And you really need to figure out how to migrate 
all your new processes to an incremental model. Now, over the next uh, 10 slides, we'll go into detail on each one of these on the techniques that we recommend our clients uh, put into practice. So first of all, troll. This is uh, as many disparate news information sources as possible. Um, entrepreneurs tend to do this pretty regularly on things like Reddit. You can do it in a large corporation by you know, assigning specific groups to monitor areas that, that may be relevant to you and reporting back. Uh, liberal arts degrees, right? Yay, it's really important here as opposed to a technical degree. So you can look at things from a broad spectrum. Um, and it's a lot of skimming. It's not a lot of in-depth yet. Ignore stuff you already know. You don't want to uh, live in an echo chamber. Look for things at the periphery. Focus on the new and the unknown. Um, learn stuff outside of your industry. Watch what other companies are doing, other industries. It can be really useful if you're not a startup to follow others, to follow startups, to see where the new emerging technologies are coming from. And then periodically do a deep dive into disciplines that are different than your normal one. Cocktail party conversation. These are some of my favorites because uh, I really suck at cocktail parties. Tell me something I don't know. Tell me something that would surprise me about, about the work you do. Uh, and what's the most interesting thing you've learned today? You, you, you can pick up a lot of interesting, interesting stuff. Keyword flagging. Now, this is a very specific prescription. And uh, after this webinar, I can, if you're interested, I can go into more detail on this. But you can get a tremendous amount of information out of Google. Uh, once you figure out what it is you're tracking, you can come up with the relevant keywords, put those into Google, search them. Uh, you can save the results in Google Alerts and do all sorts of really time-saving, efficient things. And then review those periodically. You should probably keep an ongoing notes file. We have, I have a digital one for every emerging technology. I use Google Keep occasionally to throw stuff in there and then record my initial thoughts. And then I go through those periodically and pull them back out. And then you just keep reiterating around this uh, flag concept. Grok, this is thanks to Robert Heinlein and his great sci-fi novel, Stranger in a Strange Land. One of those invented words that has stuck around because it covers a lot of ground and it's to, to understand something really deeply and intuitively. And this is critical because, like, take things like Bitcoin or Ethereum. I've gotten reasonably well educated on those two topics. And I can tell you that 50% of what passes as news on those two topics is just not true. I mean, people don't really understand at a deep enough level what blockchain is and what it can do. And I think that's really important. So if you're in charge of managing innovation in your organization, you really need to go deep enough to figure out what a new technology does and what it's designed for, and then to learn what it doesn't do well. I hear people all, of, all the time talking about blockchain can do this, blockchain can do that. No, <laughs> it's good for some stuff, and it sucks for other stuff. Um, and then this is another place where you iterate. You know, if it's still interesting as you try to understand it, learn a little bit more. And then I think it really helps to practice explaining things to others because it, it allows you to put the find the right place in your brain where each new piece lives, and that allows you to understand it, I think, more thoroughly. And there is, if you're a startup or an entrepreneur, there is an opportunity to monetize the learning process. I'll just mention that in passing because I know there's an awful lot of people that are now moving into the freelance space. So if you want to become an expert in a, in a space for other reasons, you can sometimes sell that expertise. Set inflection points. So it's not dates that drive your uh, foray into disruptive innovation. It's, it's events and inflection points. You can't say we're going to build an Ethereum blockchain in February of 2021. That's just dumb. You're going to build an Ethereum blockchain 
thing when the timing's right. So back up, figure out what needs to happen both internally and externally before it makes sense to do whatever it is you're going to do. So it's a win this, then that. So when this happens, we will do this. Uh, and that's different. I wish I could give you more uh, specifics there, but that's different for every emerging technology and every potentially disruptive innovation. Uh, it depends on who you are, what your business is, and what the technology is and what it does. Um, you know, usually early on, there's some limitation that prevents deployment of an emerging technology, whether it's uh, performance-based, technical-based, or just your organization isn't ready, or it's not ready. Well, that's fine, but figure out when those two uh, hurdles will be removed and then track those. Uh, and when they are, it's that's an inflection point. It's trying to move to the next step. So because this is a little squishy, this concept of inflection points, uh, I'll give you a specific example. Ethereum is something I've been interested in. That's the uh, non-Bitcoin blockchain that actually has uh, contracts and, and a virtual coding environment built inside. Um, the limitation today is that it can be slow. So we set an inflection point for the release of Ethereum 2.0 because one of the key factors that's going to be in Ethereum 2.0 is a 64x speed improvement. And I think that that's going to change the equation uh, of what makes Ethereum a, a relevant a disruptive technology. Now, that'll be different for every technology, but that's the basic process. And then you need to monitor, monitor regularly, looking for these inflection points, looking for new developments, looking for new implementations. And this is where we have uh, internally come up with a very refined uh, Google Alerts process that I get a daily email across a wide array of uh, emerging technologies that I can quickly review and dive into or delete. Um, bookmark folders in your browser for new technology sites that you can look at quickly. Don't spend a lot of time. You're just kind of seeing what's bubbling up. And again, you know, I like medium.com, the website, but half of what gets published there is just bullshit. It's just not true, or it's people with. Um, a, a very specific perspective that they try to sell. So you need to read medium with a very jaundiced eye. Track, continuously track the maturity and adoption and pay attention to the limitations. There is a tendency, particularly for entrepreneurs, to turn a, turn a blind eye and a happy ear to the limitations of a particular technology. Double down on paying attention to what the technology does poorly. And earlier I said, learn how to explain uh, new technology to other people as a good way to understand it. Learn how to explain what a technology doesn't do is probably twice as important. And then you're also looking for order of magnitude improvements. And this can be tricky. Let me give you a really specific example. Back in the mid 90s, 96, 97, access to the internet was through dial-up modem. Remember the beep, 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 that sound if you're old enough? And then we switched to always-on modem. Oh, sorry, always-on internet, where there was no actual connection. It was just always there. Now, that may have seemed to many at the time it did, but that was a modest improvement. But no, that was a huge difference. The use of the internet and the, the ubiquity of utility went up astronomically. So you really look for these, what it might appear to be modest improvements. You didn't have to dial up anymore. It didn't sound like a big deal. That can become tremendous from an adoption standpoint. Review, you're going to review this periodically, gauge the level of maturity, apply some metrics, uh, and you're continuously looking for when it's time to begin some experimentation, to move it out of the educational tracking phases into the experiment phase. And that's an ongoing, continuous process. 
Um, keep a running list in that notes file I mentioned earlier for the availability of tools and APIs and other educational resources. And always circulate those within your group so you can share them. And then I would, on a periodic basis, quarterly, monthly, depending on your metabolism, come up with a no-go, go, no-go go, no test that you can apply and say, is it time to do an experiment or not? And just forcing yourself into that process can be very beneficial. And then we get to the experimentation phase. So early on, before you know much, build some tentative use cases and just keep that list in your notes file. And then for each tentative use case, establish what the critical path is and look at the most likely point of failure. Managing disruptive innovation is not all, all about the future is rosy, this is going to go to the moon. It's about the rocket's going to blow up because blank, blank, blank. So it's risk management is the, at the forefront of these because most emerging technologies don't emerge, don't work, or they never reach critical mass. Uh, very few do. We remember the good ones for, for obvious reasons, but there's been a ton of stuff over the last few decades that got a lot of hype and never went anywhere. So you always want to look for the most likely point of failure and figure out when that gets they, when you can reduce that risk. And then test your hypotheses against actual behavior. If it's a consumer-based uh, innovation, don't ask people what they think. Throw something out there and see what they do. Because they don't understand the technology. They don't know what it can do. So certainly don't ask them. The great Henry Ford quote, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Uh, that's what you get if you apply the incremental innovation and customer market fit to disruptive innovation. You get a faster horse, which isn't a bad thing, but it's not a car. Uh, customer surveys, to the same point, not really worth doing at this uh, thing unless they're customer surveys in the guise of informing your customer. We've done that, um, where you make the customer feel bad because they haven't adopted a particular disruptive innovation that you're promoting. Uh, that could be an interesting technique. And what you're doing here is trying to let the product find a market. You may not have known what that market is. Keep an eye out for uh, things on the periphery that may be markets you had never thought would occur. And this is going back, now combined, is going back to where we talked about um, having a broad liberal arts degree and looking across multiple disciplines to come up with the most interesting combinations. And these are some really specific examples. So when you combined personal computers and the ethernet uh, and, and the ethernet protocol, you ended up with local area networks, which were absolutely transformative. PCs by themselves were interesting. The ethernet, um, uh, local area networks really transformed small business and businesses as we know them. SQL databases, databases been around a long time. When the internet came out in 93, you combine a SQL database with the internet, it's only of e-commerce. Uh, I know firsthand uh, how transformative uh, that, that combination can be. The internet, uh, was around, and then Java came up in the very late 90s, and you combine those two things, and you ended up with web services, which dominate today, different format, but today dominate a lot of software in infrastructure. Those are all three past ones. Now, going forward, uh, one of the ones I wanted to call out as a potential example is the Internet of Things, uh, where simply everything gets an Internet connection, to collect data or, or uh, provide functionality. Then you combine that with the new Bitcoin Lightning emerging concept, which is basically the ability to pay infinitesimally, infinitesimally small amounts of money instantly and for no fee uh, across the Bitcoin network using Lightning. That enables a whole new concept, data microtransactions, where you can pay devices a millionth of a penny to provide data. 
So just like when you put combine SQL and the internet, you got e-commerce, PCs, and Ethernet, you got local area networks. Combining IoT and the Bitcoin Lightning Network, you enable an entirely new business model, which we have yet to see. I mean, this may not go anywhere, but it's it's an interesting opportunity. Prototype. Uh, when you when you figure when you reach the right inflection point, it's time to uh, build the prototype. And this is a little different. This is the throw shit at the wall. You really want to just try the smallest deliverable product or service, uh, and not not boil the ocean. That would be a mistake because you really don't have a clue what's going to work. So a simple tool, simple service, um, and then review and iterate as fast as you can. Because you know you, you you don't want to invest a lot. You want to try a lot, and then at some point, um, you're either going to push the disruptive technology back down to level one, where you just continue to monitor it because it really didn't provide any value to you or your customers or to your organization, or it's played out its course. It's no longer disruptive. Everybody knows about it. Uh, innovation is mature, and the disruptive opportunity diminishes over time. So you need to be able to, you need to be ready to convert that disruptive innovation opportunity to uh, a more normal incremental uh, opportunity. And I thought I'd provide here before we uh, wind up what we're watching. Um, these are things that, that Shannon and I think have the potential, uh, if not already, to be incredibly disruptive opportunities from um, either providing opportunities to be disrupted or to be a disruptor. Work from home, which just bubbled up, uh, I think presents some really interesting opportunities for whole new business models. It, prevents in, it presents individual organizations with a vastly increased hiring pool. And you don't hear too much about this, but think about it. If we're all working from home, your hiring pool just became the planet. Uh, you, you no longer need to think, oh, we're going to hire six people in Cleveland. We're going to hire a local recruiter. That's not the case. If you're moving to a work-from-home environment, the, the world is your oyster now. So expand your horizons. That's just one of many potentially uh, beneficial positive disruptions from this uh, pandemic response. Same thing for us specifically at Flash Starts. Virtual teams represents a great opportunity for us because both Shannon and I have had immense experience managing virtual teams. Uh, both with our own organizations over the last few decades and with startups that we as directors or investors uh, manage on a virtual basis all the time. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, some more specific ones that have been around a little while, uh, Bitcoin, and I mentioned the Lightning Network. I think there's going to be a, a lot of uh, disrupt disruption still in both those spaces, both finance and uh, transactions. And then Ethereum. I mentioned Ethereum 2.0 earlier because this is a really key one for us. I, and I went through the process that I described here over the last three years, looking at Ethereum, understanding it at some basic level, and then deciding uh, actually after CryptoKitties that it didn't scale well enough to be a useful technology for anything we wanted yet. But Ethereum 2.0, which should begin to launch later this year, one of the things that's in it is that 64x uh, performance improvement. That changes, that's the game changer. So we're keeping a really close eye on that for our, our own purposes and our client purposes. Machine learning is one of those a little is is disruptive, but a little more, a little slower, I think. Uh, but it's reaching critical mass now, particularly in large market research organizations that have enormous piles of data that they can now apply machine learning to. But I think that is uh, poised to spread well beyond the uh, uh, the data accumulators that are using it today. 
OAuth is a, a new authorization technique which is going to be widely adopted in the in the next few months. And I don't really know. I just put that up there because I know it's coming. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time trying to figure out where the disruptive opportunity is. So with that, um, oh, oh, this is one slide I threw in at the last minute. This is um, the Web 3.0 stack. This is basically Ethereum. Uh, and Ethereum 2.0 and all the things around it. Every one of those things with a logo is a new company that is playing in the Web 3.0 stack. This is going to be a big deal. You know, 90% of these will fail, but in there somewhere is a Google and Amazon and Facebook and, and so forth. Uh, big, big space in the future. So with that, what do you, you know, what, what can you do? Well, if you have questions about disruptive innovation or any of our services or want to see a particular webinar uh, due in the future, send me an email. Uh, send us an email at lightning.network at flashstarts.com. Uh, and we also, I mean, our business today is customized coaching. If you want help with design thinking, you want help with, uh, managing virtual teams, you want help on identifying and navigating through disruptive opportunities,